your friends in Ethiopia who are excited by Russian, uh, by Russian spiritual writers. They're reading Anthony, they're reading Athanasius' life of Anthony, they're reading the sayings of the Desert Fathers. They're much closer in mind, you could say, to us than either of us is to the churches of the Western family. They are virtually the same as we. Father John Meinder put, put it to me this way. He said, they are to most of us as we are to most of the Catholics. Kind of interesting fossil to the, to the, to the side. And, and the, not without a bit of patronization too, or more than a bit. You know, well, we'll, we'll accept the little brother if they become, you know, if they become just like us. Well, I don't think that, that kind of thing wins friends and, and affects you. It's not going to come down from on high. You know, that kind of thing. We, we, in a way, we've already had that. I mean, you know, the representatives of the ecumenical patriarch, uh, other patriarch had signed that agreed statement back in 89, I think it was. What we need to do is see each other more and talk to each other and do things together. We should have Sunday school classes attending each other's liturgies. We have to have more genuine empathy and respect and that kind of thing. Only That comes about only through prolonged and extensive contact. This is Global Storyline with your host, Dean W. Arnold, where we examine events current and past and place them in the global storyline. Welcome to Global Storyline, uh, and uh, today our guest is His Eminence Archbishop Alexander Galitsyn, who is uh, Archbishop of uh, the Diocese of the South and Dallas, and also the Bulgarian Diocese for the Orthodox Church of America. Uh, Your Eminence, did I uh, did I pronounce Galitsyn correctly? Yes, pretty good. Okay, okay. Um, uh, and I and we're the Orthodox Church in America, not of America. Oh, Orthodox Church in America. That's interesting. Okay, um, learn something new every day. Um, okay, uh, uh, the Archbishop is a uh, grew up in uh, Burbank, California. Uh, went to Berkeley, got his uh, uh, degree in English there, uh, moved on to St. Vladimir Seminary in New York, uh, where he got his master's degree, and then he got a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford University in England, studied under uh, Callistos Ware, who's now the Metropolitan there. Uh, has also spent several years and vis- visited several times the Simonas Petrus Monastery in Mount Athos, Greece. Did I pronounce Simonas correctly? Simonas. Simonas. Very good. Simonas mm-hmm. Petros Monastery in Mount Athos, Greece. Uh, he then went on to teach patristics at Marquette for 23 years. Um, and uh, uh, he is a, a world scholar on mystical theology and especially Dionysius the Areopagite. Uh, uh, and has a book out uh, on that subject entitled Mystagogy. A mystical reading of Dionysius the Areopagite. That's a, a monastic book. reading of Dionysius. A monastic reading. Okay, mm-hmm. I see. I learn things all the time as we go along here. Uh, a monastic reading of Dionysius the Areopagite. That is available on Amazon uh, online. Just take a look. Um, uh, he also just some personal notes. He uh, grew up uh, uh, talking uh, theology and literature and all sorts of things around the dinner table with Alexander Schmemann. Uh, and then I'm told that uh, your Galitsyn line has some kind of royalty attached to it, so maybe you can tell me about that. They weren't royalty. They were just gentry. They were gentry, so just a step above the, uh, the peasants, but not quite royal. Well, actually, more than a step, I'm afraid, <laughs> and, since and, the peasants were serfs. And... Uh, since I didn't clarify, we're talking about Russia here. So this is a Russian, yes. Russian ancestry. Uh, what year did your uh, people come over? They left Moscow just after the October Revolution. 
Very good. Very good. <clears throat> okay, so uh, today uh, our topic is the Oriental Orthodox, also known as the Syrian mm. Orthodox, uh, and particularly the Ethiopian Church, uh, which is uh, a church that I'm particularly attached to. Mm. I've, uh, I finished my second uh, trip uh, in Ethiopia about two months ago. Um, originally, I got interested before I became Orthodox uh, as a Protestant. I saw a VHS video, I think it was a National Geographic that had a, a whole uh, hour, hour and a half long documentary on the possibility of the uh, Ark of the Covenant uh, being in Ethiopia. And uh, I was uh, I was awestruck that, that it was even a possibility. I had no idea that Ethiopia had a 2,000 year Christian heritage, much less a thousand years of possible Judaism before that. And, uh, and I was very intrigued by the whole uh, concept not that I was fully persuaded, but uh, nevertheless, uh, just the preponderance of ev evidence is is just worth looking at. So that caused me, especially when I became Orthodox, to be very intrigued with the Ethiopian Church, and uh, began to study it, got more interested, and then a year and a half ago, when I found myself going to uh, Kenya, uh, Nairobi, Kenya, for a family trip, uh, I took uh, some of that time, half the time, and went up to Ethiopia to begin to uh, explore that country, but was able to make some contacts, meet some people. And this last time that I went, I was able to spend time with the um, the uh, head academic dean uh, of the Orthodox Seminary in Ethiopia uh, with 3,000 students, kind of the John Bear of the Ethiopian mm -hmm. Orthodox Church. He's my main contact there. He's a wonderful uh, man named Girma Batu. Um, and uh, also got to meet the bishop uh, who oversees the seminary couple of the professors, uh, and of course, got to go to some holy sites and that sort of thing as well. But uh, they are very, uh, they are very enthusiastic and excited about uh, Russian mystical theologians. They want to get every book they can get in English. It's hard for them to get them there. Uh, and they feel uh, very much a kindred tor towards the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, of course, we're so you should send them my book. I should send them your book if you will. If yes. you will, if you'll send me, if if you have any that you want to donate, um, I will. Uh, I will send them directly to them, and then I might buy a few copies myself and send it as well. Right. So they would love your book, uh, Your Eminence. They sure would. Um, now, uh, for those s different spectrums of knowledge in terms of people who be listening to this podcast, but the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is not technically in communion with the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, they are in communion with the Egyptian Coptic Church. They're commu in communion with the southern, the church in southern India, with the Armenians, and a couple of others that are part of this, what we call, uh, would you rather in this podcast call them Syrian Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox? I think they prefer Oriental Orthodox okay. uh, for, to describe the group. Yeah, that's what I've been using. It's just a little confusing for some people. They always think of Asians when they think of Orientals. But um, what will uh, so uh, there, and so there's uh, six or seven expressions of the Oriental Orthodox. Uh, the Ethiopians being by far the largest. Um, but uh, we are uh, as Eastern Orthodox, which is Russia, Greece, a lot of Eastern uh, uh, European countries. Of course, the Orthodox Church in America. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the Greek churches here and, and worldwide, we are not technically in communion with the Ethiopian Orthodox nor the Oriental Orthodox, although there is a close kinship. And so we'll talk about that today. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, having kind of set that up, uh, Your Eminence, why don't you go ahead and take it from there and tell us about your impressions of the Oriel, Oriental Orthodox, and you can begin to tell us about the uh, Council of Chalcedon in the 5th century that got us to where we are today. Yes, it is a very ancient schism. 1,500 years we've not been in communion with each other. And you bring it up actually in your questions, that is the excellent point, that in spite of this being 1,500 years of division, in terms of their spirituality, their liturgical consciousness, that is their understanding of the church's worship. They are 
virtually the same as we. Uh, with respect, for example, to, as you bring up, to Roman Catholics and let alone the Protestant churches, they're much closer in mind, you could say, to us than either of us is to the churches of the Western family. So what does this division mean? What was it about? Well, that brings us to the Council of Chalcedon, which is the break. It took place in 451 AD. It was a very big deal. I think there were over 500 bishops present. It was the most of any, any of the councils that we recognize as ecumenical. And it was called to address the question of monophysitism. Monophysite is the usual epithet that is applied to the Oriental Orthodox in the textbooks. It is not a word that they like. They're very careful to tell me that they're non-Chalcedonian. They don't like the word monophysite at all. No, not at all. They will admit to being neophysite, but not monophysite. Now, what is the, what was the ostensible teaching that drew the reaction of the council? Uh, it seems to have gone back to an Archimandrite in Constantinople named Eutychius, who, at least according to the sources, claimed that when God united with man in Christ Jesus, the humanity, the humanity is utterly swallowed up. In effect, disappears. Now, none of the Oriental Orthodox churches recognize Eutychius as anything other than a heretic. None of them approve of him. But they did not accept the Council's definition of the union of God and man in Christ. The Council's definition spoke of one person in two natures. And here we come to the source of the uh, phrase monophysitism. Physitism means nature. Monophysite means a single nature. Now, the textbooks understand that phrase as referring, as equating essence with nature. Nature and essence are the same. Therefore, the Lord Jesus is God, wherein the humanity has simply disappeared. Swallowed up in the essence of God, if you will. Now, again, none of the so-called monophysites hold that position. But they do insist, on the other hand, that, our, that there is one nature in Christ. The problem here is the meaning of the word nature. The non-Chalcedonians are terminological conservatives. That is, they hold to the phraseology of St. Cyril of Alexandria, as the measure of Christological orthodoxy. And in one place, or said more than one place, Cyril speaks of one nature of God the Word incarnate. How, however, is he using the word nature? Well, in fact, he's using it to indicate a single concrete entity. He is, in effect, using it in the same way that we would use person. 
You see, these terms were not nailed down in the 5th century um, in the way that we have them now. The way we have them now is the result of much argument, not least including a, an imperial decree by Emperor Justinian, who's trying to clean up this mess. Justinian in his decree says the following, all right, everyone, listen up. From now on, we will use the word hypostasis as equating with person. Two different Greek words, hypostasis and prosopon. Prosopon is a um, countenance. And it's also a word for mask, as in, uh, as in ancient theater. Hypostasis is the word that the, Cap that the Cappadocian fathers used to denote the three of the Holy Trinity. There's one usia and three hypostases. But they use that word because it's a very strong word in Greek. It literally means, it, it literally translates as substance. So you could say that the, the Trinitarian definition in the Eastern Christian tradition is antinomical. Three substances, one being. Three things, one thing. So hypothesis there is almost an equivalent of usia, of essence, but not quite. Now, the other word, the word, the problematical word, is the word nature, thesis. This word can be used, depending on the writer, to mean something equivalent to essence, what is common to the three persons, or denoting the, uh, the, 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 well, to use it, to use the same word in our, in our English way, uh, the nature of a thing. Or it could mean a single extant thing, a person, in the way that we speak of someone's nature. That's my nature. It's my nature to act thus and so, or to speak thus and so. Well, here's the muddle then. The non-Chalcedonians continue to use the word, to insist on the word, pers uh, on the word nature in this second sense. And if you say, and for them to speak of two natures in Christ, is in essence to speak of two persons. And here they recall the person that St. Cyril wrote against at the third ecumenical council, the one only 20 years prior to Chalcedon. That is the Bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius. Now, Nestorius, one, there's argument about whether he was really off or not, but certainly his phrasing was ambiguous. Nestorius was someone who wanted to insist on God's transcendence. Therefore, it made no sense for him to speak of, say, Mary as birth giver of God, She's the birth giver of the man Jesus, yes. The eternal God isn't a, was never uh, a baby. So he bears the humanity of our Lord Jesus. She bears the humanity of our Lord Jesus with whom the word of God, the second person of the Trinity, unites.
Now, Sincero Alexandria objected strenuously to Nestorius and said, How can you call her Christotokos, a birth giver of Christ, but not Theotokos? You're denying, in effect, the reality of the Incarnation. That God truly became human in the Lord Jesus. And when you deny that, in effect, you deny what we understand to be the nature of salvation itself, which is our union with God through Christ, a true union with God. <clears throat> and so Cyril becomes the standard of Christological orthodoxy at the Council of Ephesus, the Third Ecumenical Council. And then the non-Chalcedonians see Chalcedon as a betrayal of Cyril and are going back to Nestorius because one person but in two natures. One hypothesis, the hypothesis, the hypothesis of the word of God, in two natures, but natures understood in this second sense as persons. Or that, that's how they see it in any way. So our Lord Jesus in their eyes, according uh, in the Chalcedonian definition, is kind of like two peas in a single pod. You see the pod, and the pod is one, but there are actually two things in there, two distinct things. Now, of course, the defenders of Chalcedon, some of them, some of them were very sympathetic to Nestorius in the early, especially the first generation, and their defense of Chalcedon sounded to the objectors to Chalcedon, much too much like Nestorius. So that leads to a breaking in communion. I mentioned the Emperor Justinian, who comes along 500 years after the Council of Chalcedon, and Justinian is an emperor, so he is, of course, concerned with the fact that his empire is now divided, and very seriously divided, because effectively all of Egypt, a very important province, most of Syria, and spreading up elsewhere in the empire too, are objecting to the definition of Chalcedon and have broken communion with the imperial church. So Justinian's first concern is em as emperor. He wants a united empire, and that means he has to have a united faith. How does he solve this? He calls the Fifth Ecumenical Council to do so. And what the Fifth Ecumenical Council does, in essence, is say, look, both Cyril's mia thesis, one nature of God, the Word incarnate, and Chalcedon's two natures in one person, can be, can be understood as in harmony. Uh, the, Chals the, the conciliar formula don't exactly put it that way, they put it negatively. They say, if you, mean, if you say one nature of God, the word incarnate, and mean the humanity disappears, you're a heretic, you're anathema. And if you say one nature in one person in two natures, and you mean two persons in the word, in, the, in, in Christ incarnate, you're anathema. What you must say, rather, is that the person which is one in Christ is the second person of the Trinity, in, hu in whom the human nature, that is a human essence, is impersoned. Now, that should have solved the problem, because it is essentially what the non-Chalcedonians believe. It didn't, because of other factors. The emperors prior to Justinian, and Justinian himself, later on, when he realized that his solution wasn't working, used force to 
try and bring about unity of faith. And force means blood. There was bloodshed in the hundred years between Justinian and the Council of Chalcedon. So the non-Chalcedonians had their martyrs. Um, second, who's right and who's wrong? It was Pope Leo of Rome who proposed the formula that Chalcedon enshrined in its definition. Well, for the non-Chalcedonians, Pope Leo is uh, a heretic. And on the other hand, the great critic of Chalcedon, Bishop Severus of Antioch in the early years of the 6th century, is a hero and a saint in their reckoning and is officially anathematized, uh, reckoned among the heretics by, I think, the Sixth Council. Justinian avoids that. Doesn't call names. He, he, he only calls Nestorius and Eutychus names, but he doesn't he doesn't include any of the um, any of the uh, main non Casalian te teachers. That comes later. <clears throat> so one group's saint is another group is the other group's heretic. Um, and in the and in the intervening fifteen hundred years, this simply embeds itself. And now, if, for example, if you ask the monks of Mount Athos, uh, well, many of them will express themselves in writing. What about the non-Chalcedonians? They say, let them recognize seven ecumenical councils. And. Someone like the late Pope Shenouda of uh, Alexandria, a Coptic patriarch, said, we, we only need three. We aren't doing your seven. Maybe we'll, 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 we'll take six of the seven, but not Chalcedon. And there we are. As I said, they are terminological conservatives. They did not want to depart from the phrasing of Cyril of Alexandria, and they saw those who did so, at least initially, as heretics, as Nestorians. Now, I don't think any of any who have studied the matter closely among them would hold, would hold that view. Among the Orthodox, on the other hand, there's altogether too much reliance on the on the textbook on the textbook phrasing, and not a lot of careful thinking. Except during the 1960s, this was courtesy of the World Council of Churches. Let me stop you right there. Uh, yes. I, I, every little teeny bit bit of sound is being picked up by the microphone, and I think there might be some activity going on in the room besides yourself. So just just, just be advised. So go ahead, 1960s Ecumenical Council. Uh, World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches has done us, generally does us a great favor because it allows us to get together in ways that we don't do regularly otherwise. And in the case of the issue that we're talking about today, it enabled contacts between the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, and the Oriental Orthodox. Who at a certain point looked at each other was a father of people like Father George Florovsky, who was active at the time, uh, Father John Romanides, uh, Father John Meyendorf, among others, who asked him, well, what exactly is it that divides us? And they held a series of colloquia over a space of 10, 15 years, I think it starts in the early 60s, um, and they issue a kind of agreed statement by around late 80s. And the records of these colloquia have been published in the Greek Orthodox Theological Review. If you want to go look it up, it's all, the, all the papers are there uh, in English. 
And what they arrived at the result, as a result of these discussions and uh, mutual papers was, well, we don't really believe differently. Their common statement, for example, liberally uh, deployed uh, citations from the Fifth Council under Justinian. As I said, I think he solved the problem back in the 6th century. It was just no one was ready to, to accept it. So they ended up, okay, we, we believe the same about the Lord Jesus. Well, so why can't we be together? Aha. Well, there we get into the issues that I raised. Who is a saint? Who is a heretic? How many councils are there? And maybe even more to the point, who is the Patriarch of Alexandria? Who is the Patriarch of Antioch? There are two candidates, right, for each. And in the case of the Armenians, a certain nervousness about the immensity of the Russian church. Uh, next door, a certain, I think, concern that they be swallowed up in that, which the Russians had done to the Georgians when they incorporated Georgia into the empire at the beginning of the 19th century. And of course, quite distinctive liturgies. I mean, we Eastern Orthodox are used to, well, the liturgy is liturgy. It's the liturgy of John Christus and the liturgy of St. Basil, the, the, the liturgy of the great church of Constantinople. Is our common, uh, is our common patrimony. Well, in the case of the non-Chalcedonians, just about all of them, but it's especially visible in the Armenians, the Syrians, the Copts, and the Ethiopians, there's a lot, there is a lot of influence. You don't feel totally uh, at sea going to any of those churches, but it's different. It's not the same, precisely the same text. Uh, the churches look a little different, not absolutely different, but they look a little different. I remember talking to a Greek theologian who wasn't aware that they had a different liturgy or, they would, or that they would insist on having their own and not simply adopting ours. No, he said, that's impossible. They have to, they have to worship like we worship. Um, so these things, these things are what, in, in effect, divide us. Not the substance of the faith. Now, have you, um, what can we do about it? I think that was one of your questions. Yeah. What, what, what do we do? What steps do we take? Baby steps or large steps? Well, you know, locally in the Orthodox Church, there are, there are different. There are different reactions. Where these two live together and have lived together for centuries, as for example in the Patriarch of Antioch, there is rather a considerable, God knows now what Syria is like uh, with, with the chaos uh, afflicting it, but before the horrors descended uh, there, um, there was in fact even intercommunion degree uh, faithful who didn't have their own church in the village were not discouraged at any rate by their by their bishops to avail themselves of the other church um, weddings are mutually recognized and that was in fact worked out between the cops and the Greeks in Alexandria too
And here in our country, some of us bishops um, are inclined to treat the non-Chalcedonians essentially like our own people. Now, this isn't an answer, but in, the, in those local churches abroad, there it does appear to be, or did appear, goodness knows, as I said, what's happening now in the chaos of the times. There was a kind of effective to and fro um, that wasn't strictly blocked. Now, they, they have their, especially in Ethiopia, uh, they have their rigid folk, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, those who insist, no, no, these are Nestorians. We can't be in communion with, with them. They're heretics. Just like uh, the monks of Athos, not all of them, because I've talked to a number who don't hold this year, but they've published along these lines. These people are heretics. They don't accept the seven councils. Let them submit to the uh, to the stated faith of the church in the councils. How does one deal with that? Well, in, in effect, some of them, some of that, you really can't deal with. Or as a friend of mine put it in another context, there are some problems only death can solve. Um, what we need to do is see each other more. And talk to each other and do things together. Visit each other. We should have Sunday school classes attending each other's liturgies. We should have clergy regularly meeting with each other. And they do or did. I mean, now the Orthodox don't even, the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox don't even meet among themselves uh, in most places on a regular basis. And that, of course, has to be encouraged from on top. I don't see any agreed statement, because we have an agreed statement. I don't see an agreed statement as sufficient. Just as we've lived apart from each other for 1,500 years, although not entirely apart, because you can see the, the, the influences, especially from the empire uh, and the imperial church on all, on all the oriental orthodox. Um, it's not entirely apart from each other, but the the fault lies mainly with, I think, us, the Eastern Orthodox. Just as the fault lay, I think, primarily on the side of the Imperial Church. When, for example, they had unity talks with the Armenians back in the 11th century, I think it was. The Armenians and the, and, the, and the Greeks came to an essential agreement on the faith. And so, some one of the Armenian saints, I think it might have been St. Nurses the Grateful, Graceful, said, well, okay, so it's, you know, it's up here. Wait a minute, said the Greeks. Then they raised the bar. But you don't serve exactly like us. But you use unleavened bread. But you, but you, but, 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 but. A sort of obstacle, 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 and finally the Armenian said, oh, Well, nuts to you. God bless you. We'll go our way and you go yours. But it was the fault of the, it was the fault of the on the Byzantines. The primary fault was on the Byzantines. And I think that habit of thinking is too much, still much with us. Rather than asking, well, what do you believe? 
what is your faith? As those people did in those colloquia that are published in the, you know, and that, that, came, that were written in the 60s and 70s and 80s. They asked that. And the answer they got was, well, sounds like what I believe. Let me ask you this. Um, the, uh, you know, be, being, I started out as a Protestant, and of course, <laughs> As a Protestant, it's sola scriptura, and the scriptures mm -hmm. themselves are where you find ultimate truth. That's the, you know, that's the yes. that's the one non-negotiable place where you can find ultimate truth. And then, of course, as you study that doctrine of sola scriptura, you find out it doesn't work out very well. And then, on my road to becoming Orthodox, uh, my understanding, and maybe you can enlighten me, but my understanding is that if we say that we ultimately follow the church which interprets the scriptures my understanding is that the ultimate place where we find truth is in the ecumenical councils so the seven ecumenical councils are the binding mm -hmm. kind of the orthodox version of you know the solo scriptura that's the that's the 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 uh the 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 oracle you know the um so when you when you suggest that we need to, uh, or or when the whole concept of going from seven to three councils, or maybe there's something else besides ecumenical councils that are the ultimate way that we find truth, help me out with that. Well, as you just phrased it, and you used I think at one point the word oracle, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> um. I don't think it's helpful to think of the councils that way. In fact, I think that can be a sort of trap. I, and I think we, must accept the seven councils as we have them as articulating the faith. Orthodoxly. But that doesn't mean necessarily that the faith others might hold who are not part of the communion of the seven councils. That faith may be identical. Substantially identical. That is identical in substance, in reality. The councils provide us with a kind of precision. For example, that those decisions, those precisions regarding those terms that I spoke of earlier. Well, I think there's, certain, there's a certain usefulness to that. It prevents confusions that, exact, that exactly arose and, in fact, acted to divide the church in the, uh, in the debates of the 5th and 6th and centuries. So, that's good. But to raise the precisions, as it were, to the level of the absolute bedrock, what makes us Orthodox Christians, isn't a formula, uh, a verbal formula. It is the faith in God the Word made flesh, and in our communion with God the Word made flesh through His body, the Church. That's the, that's the substance, as I understand it. And in that case, I think, there is the same substance among them, the non-Chalcedonians. So, I'm not arguing for flexibility in the sense of um, tolerance of what's wrong, but maybe tolerance 
or a different and perhaps less precise way of articulating the thing. If insisting on our own way keeps us from communion. I said at the beginning of my remarks, these these people read, you know, read for the most part the same fathers. If you go to their monasteries, like in Egypt or in Syria, they're reading, they're reading Anthony, they're reading Athanasius' life of Anthony, they're reading the sayings of the Desert Fathers. They're reading, in fact, they made their own collections of these. Um, there are some uh, variants that exist only in, say, Ethiopic. Uh, or in Coptic, but it's the same thing, it's the same substance. Or your friends in Ethiopia who are excited by Russian, uh, by Russian spiritual writers, or some of the cops I know who, or I've heard of anyway, who are translating selections from the Philokali into English. That reminds me of, um, you know, the story of Matthew the Poor, uh, one of the great figures in the uh, contemporary revival of the Coptic Church, especially of its monasticism. Uh, he was a pharmacist, I think, in Cairo in the early 50s, who liked the rich, who liked um, the rich young man because he was well-to-do and prosperous heard the heard the word of our Lord, sell everything you have, like St. Anthony. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And so the young man does this and retires to a cave above the Nile, armed with an Arabic translation of the scriptures um, and kind of eccentric English translation of St. Isaac the Syrian and the Kaglubowski Palmer selections from the Philokalia put out by Faber and Faber in the early 50s. He draws disciples, more disciples, more disciples. Eventually they move into one of the uh, near abandoned monasteries in Skiti. I think uh, St. Macarius Monastery. And the Egyptian the Egyptian revival renewal is well underway. So it was the you know, it was the Philokalia and Isaac of Nineveh, together with the scriptures, that nourished him. How can one not see in that something, not just in common, but something fundamentally akin? They see our fathers as theirs, at least these ascetical writers. <clears throat> They're nourished from the same sources. And they produce, I would think, similar results. Why would you, um, uh, uh, would you uh, like to take a guess at why uh, the Western Church, as I said in one of those questions, seems to be so much farther away from Eastern Orthodox Church, whereas the Oriental Orthodox seem to be so close? Why, why, why would that be? Well, first of all, like us, the wellsprings of Oriental Orthodox spirituality, I, and, uh, I hope I don't generalize too much, um, but they are the monastic life, <clears throat> the ascetical tradition, just as with us. Orthodox spirituality is properly 
monastic spirituality. Not that the not that we uh, we who are not monks are uh, have to go to a monastery to be completely orthodox, but it's just that the monasteries are understood as a sort of laboratories, if you will, the laboratories for the most intense expression of the Christian life. They're deliberately constructed art artifices, if you will, of the church's tradition intended to provide the, the maximum possible support for the integral Christian life. And that's why they're understood as exemplary. Well, the, the Oriental Orthodox have the same understanding. That's not the case, however, in the West from probably the rise of the uh, mendicant orders uh, and then the other orders in the later Middle Ages and the counter-reform. There are Catholics, I understand, who Father Placid de Say speaks of his grandmothers who, whose high places were the great Benedictine abbeys of France. Um, but that's not common among Catholics, certainly not among Catholics here in the U.S., but I think in, in Western Europe, too. Monasticism is kind of a part, and they speak rather of spirituality in the plural. Dominican spirituality, Franciscan spirituality, Jesuit spirituality, Carmelite spirituality, this, that, the other. Whereas we don't use the plural. There's only one spirituality. There's only one well, all are to have the same whether 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 the butcher uh, or the monk or the housewife they're all to have the same fundamental understanding of what it is to live the Christian life and if one falls short one is aware of falling short Gregory Palamas would not have had uh, the kind of arguments he had with Balaam uh, 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 that he, he wouldn't have had those with Oriental Orthodox because they were on the same page. Is what, that's your point. I think so. I think he would have had an argument with some because Balaam, after all, was, an, was technically an Orthodox Christian. Um, so, I think the best among them would have recognized in St. Gregory uh, a voice in the tradition. Uh, let me ask you this. I'm sure you've been very careful with your words, because um, you are, are an archbishop, um, and, you know, you've mentioned that there's, there's a going to be uh, people on Mount Athos who are very critical of the Oriental Orthodox, and there's going to be pockets, but what is your sense of the general tone across the board of, of Eastern Orthodoxy on this issue? Generally favorable, generally skeptical, uh, uh, not even kind of, a, uh, uh, not even interested? What, where do you think uh, people stand? Well, I think most it's the last. Not really interested. All right. Not work up about it, not thinking about it. In the way, and Father John Meyer put, put it to me this way. He said, they are to most of us as we are to most of the Catholics. Kind of interesting fossil to the, to the, to the side. And and the, not without a bit of patronization, too, or more than a bit. Well, I don't think that, that kind of thing wins friends and, and affects, affects union. Thus, thus your point that um, interaction and uh, 
uh, just improving the relationship and, and uh, spending time together uh, would be a, a, a major part towards long-term uh, improvement. Yes. Very good. I don't see any other way. It's not going to come down from on high. You know, kind of thing. We, we, in a way, we've already had that. I mean, you know, the representatives of the Ecumenical Patriarch, uh, other patriarchates signed that agreed statement back in 89, I think it was. I don't know the Russians did, but they didn't, they weren't again it. Um, essentially, they had to look at it more carefully. But one doesn't get the sense among them, with them that there's, a, there's active hostility with respect to it. I don't know if that exists anywhere among the, the church hierarchy. <clears throat> but there's also, but there is, I think, very much that, that other thing that I just spoke of, that kind of patronizing, you know, well, we'll, we'll accept the little brother if they become... You know, if they become just like us, that won't, that won't do it. We have to have more genuine empathy and respect and that kind of thing. Only that comes about only through prolonged and extensive contact. Well, I will try to be a part of, uh, of the solution in that regard, and uh, we'll see what the Holy Spirit does, how he leads us in that. Um, I think we've covered uh, a lot of the ground uh, today. Thank you so much, Vladika. Do um, uh, you have any parting thoughts or some things you'd want to share here as we wrap up? No. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Well, uh, I really appreciate it. I think you've really helped us quite a bit. Now, I'm going to go back and review a lot of what you said, and and may even before I upload this podcast, I may actually order the, um, the I think it's the Greek Orthodox Journal you said that has these um, Greek Orthodox Theological Review. Yeah, I may actually order those and kind of look through them and kind of stuff and kind of get up to snuff on this because I want to get the technicals correct and uh, and then and 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 put this together. But I think it's really important. I really appreciate it. Uh, I imagine that when I send this to uh, my contacts and people in Ethiopia, they're going to be uh, very encouraged that uh, that there is a hierarch uh, here who is uh, affirming, who's loving them and desirous. You know, we, we might not be able to accomplish unity overnight, but we can certainly be desirous of it. And I think they're going to be uh, thrilled with that. So thank you very much. I hope so. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.